My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. Kingston is a beautiful city in Ontario, Canada, that is located on the northeast end of Lake Ontario. This location has the name of the Limestone City because of its countless heritage buildings that were constructed using local limestone. Kingston was the first capital of the United Province of Canada, and while it held this distinction for only a short time, it has remained a very important military installation. Today, it is the home of two major universities, three major hospitals, and is a well-known tourist area. Kingston has been the site of many important Canadian historical events, and with that comes tales of ghosts, graveyards, and death. Due to this, Kingston today is a prime destination for paranormal enthusiasts. So grab your hot chocolate and snuggle in, my spooky friends. You're about to hear the tales of the ghosts that walk the streets of Canada's most haunted city. The first stop on our haunted tour is the Prince George Hotel, which is otherwise known as the Herkimer McPherson Building. This downtown Kingston landmark started its days as a residence, and today it is deeply embedded into the city's folklore. It was originally built as the family home for Lawrence Herkimer between 1817 and 1820, and it sits adjacent to Kingston City Hall located on Ontario Street. After Lawrence passed away, his wife Elizabeth stayed in the home until she passed it to their son Charles. Charles rented it to his son-in-law in 1840, and then in 1846, a merchant named William Henry Alexander leased the building from them. It was here that the Prince George was converted into shops and warehouses. It also housed two saloons on the ground floor. In 1848, a fire ravaged the building and soon construction was started for repairs and to build a second building on the property. It was designed by William Cloverdale, who was a master builder who worked on or oversaw the building of several important properties in Kingston. In 1892, the original house and the newer building were made into one with the addition of a full-width veranda and balcony that is in the Second Empire style. This created the famous facade that still exists today. In 1819, this location gained the name that it's known by today when it opened up as a hotel. Today, the Prince George is home to several popular establishments. The first one is Monty's, which is a restaurant inside the very popular Tiranog Irish pub that's on the first floor. The second is an English pub called the Speckled Hen, and the upper floors contain 13 rental apartments. But before you go and take a tour of these to see if your furniture will fit, you may think twice. This place is very famous for its hauntings and for a legend about a girl in love. Her name was Lily Herkimer, and she was the daughter of the original owner, Lawrence. Lily and her family were considered to be quite wealthy and high class. Lawrence and Elizabeth had very high expectations that their daughter would end up marrying somebody from the same station in life. But what they didn't know was that Lily was in love, and it wasn't with somebody that they would consider to be acceptable for their daughter. Kingston was a major port, and the Prince George Hotel is right beside the waterfront. It was there that Lily met a sailor, and the two fell deeply in love. Knowing that her parents would not approve, Lily came up with a signal to let her man know that the coast was clear and he could sneak up to her room for a rendezvous. She would light a lantern and place it on the windowsill of her open window in her bedroom. One night, Lily lit the lantern and placed it on her windowsill. She then lay down and fell asleep while she waited. It was windy that night and the wind knocked over the lantern and started the room on fire. By the time Lily awoke and saw what was happening, it was too late. Now, that is the most popular story of what happened, but there is another. In the second version of this tale, Lily would sit for hours on that windowsill watching the waterfront. It was here that her heart would fill with joy as she would see her lover coming for a visit, but one day she saw something that she would never get over. She saw her boyfriend's ship sinking in the harbor. He did not survive. 
It is said that Lily never left the Prince George, and she is one of several spirits who remain there. So now, my spooky friends, it's kind of time for me to confess something to you. Years ago, I was part of a paranormal investigation team, and I decided to look into the Lily legends. There are no known records to verify Lily's existence, but other documents tell of one that used to be. It is nicknamed the Herkimer Secret, and this document allegedly spoke about Lily and some of the Herkimer family issues. Through time, this document disappeared, but with a name like that, I would love to read it. So if anyone knows where it is, please go and email me. Maybe it would explain why the ghostly apparition of a young woman in period dress is often seen looking out of the window of room 304 towards the harbour. Many people think that the spirit is of Lily, and she's waiting for her sailor to come home, but others think not. Others believe that this is actually an imprint, since many claim to see the spirits of a young woman and a sailor inside the Tiranog pub. Most of the ghostly activity in this hotel is centered on the third floor, and in particular, room 304. Staff report constant electrical disturbances and doors opening and closing on their own. Those staying in the apartments claim that they see two different spirits there, one being an adolescent girl, and the other is the shadowy spirit of a woman. Is one of these Lily? And if so, who is the other one? Now, back to the Tiranog. For years, both patrons and staff spoke about the strange activity that takes place here, which includes furniture moving on its own, silverware and glasses falling to the floor, and people getting touched by unseen hands. There is even a report of a person once having a full conversation with a woman that nobody around them could see. So, being curious, one dark winter night, I decided to check all of this out for myself. My friends and I went to Kingston to have dinner one night, and we afterwards decided to go to the Tiranog pub. After we ordered drinks, I decided to take a little walk to see what information those working that night might tell me. So let's just say the staff were a chatty bunch. After introducing myself to one of the staff members, this person took me for a private tour of the building and introduced me to various staff members along the way. This delightful lady had many stories to tell about the Prince George and all the entities within it. She told me the story about Lily, but made it clear that even though the local legends tell that she mostly haunts the third floor, she's actually all over the place since she is now this location's protector. For a week before my visit to this location, candles located throughout the Prince George started lighting themselves. All the staff were talking about it since they believed that Lily was trying to tell them something. Several days after I was told this, disaster struck. On New Year's Eve that year at 12.04 a.m., the Prince George started to burn. The fire started on the third floor and luckily all staff and guests were able to escape unharmed. After this occurred, those who worked there were positive that Lily was trying to protect them and her former home from harm. Why? Well, according to the staff I spoke to that night, this old hotel has been almost destroyed by fire every 100 years, and the date of this fire was pretty close to that date. It seems that Lily does not want other people to go through what she did. But that is not the only stories that they told me. There are other spirits that haunt this legendary location. One of these is a nun who wears full habit. She is mostly observed walking the lower floors and is seen looking out of the windows. She is considered to be benign, but the others are not. Many staff and guests have had experiences with the spirits of two large men who are not so nice. These spirits are said to favor the door staff, and many of these experience the feeling of being watched and hear something evil growling at them. Is it the spirits of those two men growling, or is it something else? Well, there may be clues in this building's basement where they store the beer kegs. I was told that staff do not like to go down there because when they do, they see shadow people and they also hear a growling. Maybe whatever is doing that growling left their mark down there. In the massive oak timbers that support this building in the basement, there are deep claw marks in that wood. Another place I had to check out is called McBurney's Park, which has the very original nickname of Skeleton Park. 
This park is one of the largest hidden, or not so hidden, burial grounds in the entire area. Skeleton Park began its existence as the upper burial ground in 1819. It quickly filled due to epidemics of typhus and cholera that hit the area, and was closed to burials in 1864. It was at this time where, basically, people started to ignore this place. All the maintenance stopped, and the cemetery quickly fell into disrepair. Local farmers started to allow their cattle to graze in the old cemetery, which only added to the burial sites being disturbed and the headstones being damaged. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened there. During these times, Kingston was very well known for its most popular export, human bodies. This place was one of Canada's epicenters for body snatching from the 1820s to as late as the 1920s. So in other words, if you were buried, you wouldn't necessarily stay buried. For the most part, this horrible act was carried out by medical students from the nearby Queen's School of Medicine, which is one of the premier medical schools in Canada. Medical students at the time needed to complete anatomy courses to graduate, as they do today. During these times, Queen's provided cadavers to the school's anatomy department for students' use, but documents show that Queen's for the most part purchased these bodies from the students themselves. Many of them would dig up the recently deceased and then sell the body to the university for a tidy sum, and then the university would give them back that same body to dissect as part of their own classes. Everyone at the time was happy with this arrangement since the students got paid and the school didn't have any blood on their hands. Due to the high body count at Skeleton Park, it was a regular target for body snatchers. By the late 1880s, Kingston was growing quickly. Needing more space, the city decided to disinter the bodies buried at Skeleton Park and move them to other locations. However, most of the bodies didn't end up going anywhere. This was because a portion of them were unclaimed by family and others were left due to they weren't decomposed enough. This in part was due to Kingston having a very high water table, with many of these people dying from cholera and typhus, many became worried about what would happen if these possibly contagious bodies were dug up. Now, due to the city of Kingston was built on bedrock with a shallow amount of topsoil on it, this resulted in many not being buried the expected six feet deep. In actuality, most lay just below the surface. Now Kingston had a dilemma. They felt that they couldn't move all the bodies and these bodies weren't that deep. So what did they do? They decided just to knock over the headstones, throw some dirt and grass seed on it, and say it was now a city park. Due to shoddy record keeping, no one knows exactly how many bodies still lie just underneath the surface. That itself makes this a creepy place to walk. I personally toured this location, and amongst the pathways and the playground, there are headstones of the long dead that pop up all the time. I literally saw these myself. It seems that no matter how hard that the city officials try to make us forget, the dead keep coming back to show us that they're still there. And the thing is, my spooky friends, that is not the only way they let us know that they're still around. It has been estimated that there is at least 10,000 bodies that lie in this park that is about the size of city block. There are plenty of local stories about how through the years, children would find headstones and use them as bases when they played baseball. There are further tales that back in the 1950s, it was a fad for kids to go down to Skeleton Park and find human bones. They would attach these to their bicycles as a strange rite of passage. So, considering all of this desecration that occurred over hundreds of years, it is not surprising at all that Skeleton Park is said to be haunted. Since its very early days, people have claimed to see apparitions at Skeleton Park. Many report that they feel like they're being watched and followed while at this location. Disembodied voices of people talking are often heard, alongside the sounds of screams and crying. There have been countless sightings of ghostly figures of men and women walking through the park and of ghostly children playing amongst the gravestones that no longer stand there. Some of these ghosts are said, though, to be quite aggressive. People have experienced being touched or hit, with this resulting in either cuts or bruising. Even the houses that are nearby are said to experience constant ghost activity. 
from seeing apparitions, having items in these houses move around on their own, and doors and windows opening and closing themselves, it seems that Kingston will never escape its attempts to hide its past. The next place on our spooky tour is called the Rockwood Asylum for the Criminally Insane. This place was one of the very first criminal asylums in Canada before Canada was even a thing. Located at 752 King Street West, it was established in 1859 when the nearby Kingston Penitentiary became overrun with inmates that were considered to be mentally ill or criminally insane. So as a solution for this, the Rockwood Asylum was built on the shores of Lake Ontario near the penitentiary by the prisoners themselves. Construction was completed in 1870, but the men were allowed to occupy completed portions of the building as early as 1862. Female prisoners, they weren't as lucky. They got to live in the old horse stables that was on that property and were not allowed to move inside until 1868. To be transferred to the Rockwood Asylum, you had to meet their criteria. The first was that you had to become insane while you were locked up at the Kingston Penitentiary. If not, you had to be charged with an offense which you committed while you were insane. You also became an inmate if you were considered to be dangerous or if a jury determined you were insane. Patients would have to wear uniforms that had the word lunatic on them and would be forced to submit to treatment. Now, to be very clear, in these times, there was not actual treatment for those who suffered from mental illness. The goal was to calm them, and this was done by giving them strong sedatives or alcohol. They also used bloodletting as a way to weaken them. Dr. Litchfield, who was the only physician at Rockwood for many years, had a very simple treatment plan that he gave all the inmates. Free use of alcohol by day, sedatives by night, and regularly restraining the patients. On top of this, he used blistering, leeches, enemas, and regular bloodletting. The patients also endured lobotomies, and often these were performed on people who didn't come from the prison. This procedure was performed on individuals from the community that today would be considered to have minor mental health issues, were lepers, or women who were thought to be promiscuous. By 1959, patients started to be transferred out of the main building to others that were built on the same property. Afterwards, the asylum became a residence for individuals who suffered from disabilities. It was closed in the year 2000, and this historical building sat empty with its ghosts ever since. These are the spirits of the forgotten, as record-keeping at those times was not the best, especially for women. For many of the women who were placed here, their records are either blank or don't exist at all. Today, there are countless stories about the paranormal activity that's said to occur at the Rockwood Asylum. Many people report seeing spectral figures of men and women and hearing voices. There are often abrupt temperature changes that come and go, and people report hearing whispers, pounding noises, and footsteps throughout the building when no one else is there. But one of the scariest things reported is that people still hear the screams of those long gone coming from this building and seeing an unexplained lime green light glowing from a first story window while the building does not have electricity running to it. In this light, people claim to see the shape of a person who's staring outside towards freedom that they'll never receive. But the most famous ghost who haunts Rockwood Asylum is said to be of Dr. William Metcalf. William was the driving force behind transitioning Rockwood away from its origins as an asylum for the criminally insane to a facility that aligned with other hospitals of that time who cared for the mentally ill. His main focus was creating treatment plans that were humane. He abolished the constant use of restraints and he instituted recreational and occupational programs. He improved the facility's decor and took away those uniforms that labeled patients as lunatics. He also introduced better health care and educational opportunities. William worked hard to improve the conditions by increasing the patient's sense of freedom, but it seems that William is unable to free himself from this place. In the early hours of August 13th, 1885, William was doing rounds. It was here that a patient named Patrick Maloney attacked William. Patrick suffered from an extreme state of paranoia, and in this state, he stabbed William with a knife repeatedly in his abdomen. William passed away three days later from his injuries. 
Before this building's closure in 1995, William was the most commonly reported spirit seen at this location. He is said to be dressed in 19th century clothing and is seen walking up and down the hallways going in and out of rooms like he's still checking on his patients. It seems that William still cares about his patients' welfare, even 139 years after his death. Considering the thousands of tortured souls who suffered in or passed away in this building, it is a bit of a relief to know that there's one spirit who continues to look out for them in all eternity. Rocklow Courtyard is a charming network of alleys in downtown Kingston, and it leads you to a beautiful courtyard where you can find two eateries, Shea Piggy Restaurant and the Toucan Pub. Now, I love taking this alley as a shortcut to Shea Piggy, which is an amazing place to eat. But when I do, I always take a risk. This is because this alley and courtyard is said to be home to a very chilling tale. This story starts with a man who walked down this alleyway to go downtown. He felt something unseen rush past him and then suddenly in front of him, a woman appeared. She was wearing clothing from what he thought was the Victorian age and as she walked towards him, it appeared like she was trying to speak to him. But this man could not understand what she was trying to say. He stood in shock as this woman suddenly disappeared in front of his eyes. Now, according to local legend, this area used to be an old carriageway, and the lady that the man saw that day was a woman named Teresa Ignis Bean, who was murdered there. The spirit of Teresa is not shy. She consistently reaches out to the living in attempts to speak to them, and not just in that alleyway. She is also said to haunt the local businesses in the alleyway and begs them for help. In the 1970s, a photographer who had his shop in this alleyway decided to try to find out more about Teresa. So he asked his assistant to stay late, and the two of them decided to attempt to reach out to whoever was haunting his business. They didn't have to wait very long before a spirit responded. She said her name was Teresa Ignis Beam, and she was murdered in 1868 by her lover, John Napier. The night of her death, Teresa and John were planning to meet up at the Rocklow Courtyard, where she excitedly told him that she was pregnant with his child. Now John, he was not pleased when he heard this news. After all, he was a very important entrepreneur, and he was a married man with children. News of him getting his mistress pregnant alone would destroy his reputation. But the thing is, my dear listeners, Teresa was also his aunt. Now, Teresa didn't think her pregnancy was a bad thing at all. She believed that this child was a blessing, and when everyone found out how deeply in love they were, people wouldn't care about that whole having sex with your aunt while married and getting pregnant out of wedlock thing. So in a fit of rage, John strangled Teresa to death in that alley. John, he felt no remorse about what he did. He literally just left and sent some of his hired help to go back to the alley. When there, they found Teresa's body and dismembered her before they buried her body parts in various spots in this alley. To this day, Teresa wanders up and down this alley begging for help. It is said that her spirit is so active that she is considered to be one of Kingston's most active ghosts. She tells those who she encounters the tale of her murder while begging for them to help her find her bones. Many believe she does so since she's mourning her child, and others think it's because she was not properly put to rest as per her Catholic death rites. But regularly to this day, people still encounter the spirit of Teresa, dressed all in black, begging for help. In the years after her death, people have tried to find Teresa's remains without luck. Perhaps someday she'll be found, and then finally Teresa can rest. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. Today, we only touched on a few of the many ghostly tales of Kingston, Ontario. Be sure to stay tuned, since there are just so many ghost stories that we're planning another episode very soon to tell you some more. Join us on social media on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on X at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1 to tell us your thoughts about some of the spirits that wander throughout Canada's most haunted city. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast. 
For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Vampire of Gibson Cemetery. If you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you really should check out our store. You'll find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of amazing perks like ad-free episodes, free merchandise, additional episodes, and much, much more, join our fan club on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifying history to sign up today. Thank you all for listening. And until next time.